Okay, we'll get going again. So by this point, are you really feeling those seeds landing and how some of them are sprouting and some are just absolutely just sitting there? It's okay. Remember, it's all okay. So we're, we're going to look at the season more specifically. So I, I just want to introduce you to some orchard calendar language. So in, in the early part of the season, it isn't like bloom happens on May 10th. Bloom happens when there's been enough accumulated warmth of the sun to have accomplished certain bud stages that leads to the blossoms opening. So on, on apple, we use terms like quarter inch green, and right now I'm referring to fruit buds. They pop, show green tissue before leaf bud. Half inch green, and then you see the tight cluster, and then you see the buds spread apart a little bit. That's called open cluster. And then you see a smile of pink, and then there's a blossom. And then there's fruit set, and you can define fruit set by the size of the little fruitlet. There'd be eight millimeter, millimeter stage, 14 millimeter stage. Or I like to just remember what our great grandparents were doing. And, and that was where this term cover sprays come from. And, and cover sprays, the idea was that like, let's say every 10 days, you would go out and cover the orchard with lead arsenic. Um, we're not doing that, but I just like to remember, this is what was done. Um, but that's fruits in process at that point. Now, if it's a different fruit, um, you have different words. So here's a peach and the stone fruits grow with a shuck and then they come out of the shuck. So you'll see where, or you'll, instead of pink, you'll see the term popcorn stage, which that's a pear word, that's a plum word as well. So they're slightly different terms, but it's referring to different bud stages and what's going on then. So we're, we're gonna do the whole calendar here. So we'll also talk about some things going on in harvest and preparing for winter. Yeah. So that's the concept of that. And now we're going to go to the spray framework, which I do have. So the very final two pages of your handout is a very dangerous document. And I only do this when I am here to teach directly. I don't have this posted on my website, and it was something I created post-book, so it's not in the book yet. It's dangerous in that this is a template. It isn't that I'm saying you do everything on this page. It's that this is trying to capture the whole season and what you might be doing if you have a certain thing going on. So, so some of this is really general. In uh, Holistic Orchard, I talked about the four sprays of spring. I, that to me is just a basic. You know, okay, let's, let's even step back before that. If I just planted trees, in those first few years before I get into the bearing years, my goal might be I'm going to do an application of the holistic core recipe four to six times, approximately two weeks apart. I wouldn't even be thinking about bud stages, and, and there's certainly no fruit pests coming on. But remember, I'm also not spraying because I have a problem. I'm spraying to boost nutrition. I'm spraying to replenish arboreal biology, but that biology is also being replenished on the soil surface, and I'm making, helping making more nutrients available. So to me, this is just a, a good tonic. Do you have to do that? No. But once you start developing actual specific issues, then you go into that, what is it I have? Where's the launching pad? What's the period I have to definitely do something? And that's when you start to match with what's going on here. So the, the next level of involvement would be as a home orchardist. And I might do six sprays plus the fall spray. And the six sprays would be what I call six or seven sprays, what I call the spring sprays and the comprehensive sprays. Now, the fourth column on this chart, I identify windows in the season. So the primary infection window that was totally about apple scab or something like cherry leaf spot. Um, this, there's things definitely going on, plus bud stages are developing when the tree might need some extra trace minerals. That next window 
The fruit sizing window is when cedar apple rust kicks into high gear. It's when fire blight continues to be an issue beyond bloom. So in a really warm, moist late spring, I'd be thinking about, I gotta be sure I get the timing of these things right. Now, when you see the orange bars going across, that has to do specifically with insects. So for instance, some of you are not gonna have borers, be it the round-headed apple tree borer or the moths that get after, the peach tree borer that get after stone fruits. You're not gonna do a spray for that. You don't have it. That's why I'm, I'm trying to plant the idea that this is a template. Similarly, <coughs> in the growth stage labeled bloom, I'm gonna talk about the competitive colonization boost for fire blight. Well, that's only applicable when <coughs> it gets to be 80 degrees or more during the bloom time and it's moist. Those are, are rampant fire blight conditions. And, and this isn't about like protecting your fruit so you get a better portion of the harvest. This is about protecting your tree so it doesn't die. And as a home orchardist, that might be useful to understand just enough to get out there and do something when those conditions are right. Then as you get into being a commercial orchardist, um, and you're dealing with apple scab, you're dealing with cedar apple rust, you're dealing with fire blight. You're also very concerned about, you're somewhat concerned about certain aesthetics. So there are fungi that come on in the summer, and we're gonna see some pictures, that feed on the waxy cuticle called sooty blotch and fly speck. They look like a smudginess on the skin of the apple, or, or fly speck looks like these little dots where a fly poop. Um, they're not a concern at all. You know, I, I like to think I can get customers enlightened enough to understand this is like I'm giving you some free gourmet probiotics. You're, you're lucky you have this on the surface of your fruit. But we'll look at that. But on the other hand, if I can lessen it some, so it's not a major, totally doesn't even look like something resembling an apple to people who are used to supermarket standards, um, I'm going to do that. And in a really wet summer, I have to deal with rots a lot more than I do in a dry summer. So sometimes I, I cut off my spray schedule, definitely rarely do anything in August. I could if it was super wet or I was having a specific issue that I needed to deal with. So typically I make 10 or 12 spray applications a year. And commercially that's, that's not below average, that's not above average. There's certainly growers, whether using chemicals or, or using conventional organics, who do more applications. But my goal is to do less, but to do what I need when I need to do it, so that I'm dealing with the issues I face to produce a marketable crop, because I'm selling dessert fruit. There's a cider component to my operation as well, but my goal is to sell dessert fruit. It's also complicated, and I'll get into this, the reason those orange bars are separate is typically what you're doing for insects has to be done separately from the holistic sprays. And there's two principal reasons there. One of the products I use is that refined kaolin clay. I'm gonna get into the details of that. But if I put that in with the fats of the seed oils, I would clog the sprayer. On top of that, I would undo the mechanism by which the clay works. And that is when the insect crawls through a clay-covered leaf and along a stem, the particles flake off and it irritates it so it wants to go somewhere else. If I put it on with fats, I'd be sticking the clay to the tree and it wouldn't work. So I, I have to, in those two, three weeks, spray the holistic first. The same day I can spray the clay, but it has to be laid over top. So it, it depends what you're working with. You may not work with the clay. That becomes irrelevant then. But right now, this is a template. And on the back page, the second page, um, you see rates, which in this case are the community orchard rates, 100 gallon per acre spray with a tractor sprayer. Um, if you're doing a backpack, that holds four gallons. That's 125th of 100 gallons. 
but you can also go on the Grow Organic Apples website and in the Biologic Curriculum button on the left-hand menu, you'll find different articles and one of them to do with holistic sprays gives the backpack rates as well. It's in the book, but it's also on the website. So I think that that introduces the concept of some timing aspects, the fact that there's windows, now we have to match what are we dealing with. Um, when I told you apple scab is in that primary infection window, well, cedar apple rust is really the last half of that and the whole next fruit sizing window. So if that's your issue, you know, you're going to keep spraying. Um, and another aspect which is seen in the first column, once we get into fruitlet stage, is you'll see a seven to, ta a seven to 10 day interval. This is when everything's so intense, so many things are happening. But then in the summer, even with rots, it becomes more like a two week window. So there's also, it's not all regular timing. So I, I gave you a very simple version to start with young trees, or if you just don't want to think about things and you're willing to do four sprays, great, do them two weeks apart. The next step in getting into this is timing the sprays to bud stages. And then the next step gets you more into commercial growing and I'll, I'll give you some of that, but we're, we're not gonna go too far with that aspect. So the spring sprays are straddling the primary infection window principally of scabs, but it, there's also overlap with things like cedar apple rust. The bloom time aspect fire blight comes into play. Everything is happening in that fruit sizing window. That's what I'm calling the comprehensive sprays. I'm just trying to create a common language so we can talk about things. The summer sprays are addressing rots and aesthetic fungi. A very dry summer and, and knowing the secret of how to eliminate those aesthetic, uh, not eliminate, but how you can make the apple look better um, means you wouldn't be doing that. The fall spray is very much about the next season. It's helping to decompose or inoculum over winters, and it's also addressing some of the pests that hide in bud scales and behind curly bark. And I'll, I'll we'll get into some of those details. So let's take them in order. Actually, I don't have a slide for the very first. <laughs> the very first growth stage listed there is bud swell. So if, if you've read older orchard books or extension literature, you might be familiar with the concept of dormant oil. That's something that's done at the bud swell stage. I don't do that at all <coughs> because when I create a diverse ecosystem with lots of beneficials and I don't spray an organophosphate for one of my major fruit pests, I don't kill the beneficials that keep things like mites and aphids in check. Dormant oil is all about smothering the eggs of things like mites and aphids. That's a non-issue for me. It, it has a, a function if you're dealing with an insect called scale, whether it's San Jose scale or oyster shell scale. But that's a specific thing. But that's not something you do. On the other hand, if you're dealing with, let's say, peach leaf curl, that overwinters in the bud scales of the peach tree. And before the leaves grow, those bud scales are exposed. And an application of copper can be really useful against peach leaf curl. But you should read into that. Don't do that spray if you're not growing peaches or you've never seen peach leaf curl. It's, it's not you got to think. That's why this is a dangerous document. <laughs> and if I released it just into the general world, there's many people who don't think. <laughs> so in the primary infection window, that first one or two sprays of spring, I'm hitting the ground as much as I'm hitting the branch structure. I'm, again, the idea mm -hmm. of pulsing the fatty acids fueling the mycorrhizal fungi as feeder roots start to come on. It's just beefing up the system. So the ground application has a lot of relevance as well as the tree. And, and by the tree, I don't just mean the branches and the buds that are showing tissue. I also am hitting that trunk quite solidly. And I haven't explained Neem's action yet in terms of insects. But on the trunk, there may be some moth larvae that are overwintering. And neem is going to change the dynamics before they even become adults to lay eggs 
or you might have fruit problems. So I'm thinking about that whole fungal duff zone from the ground on up to the tip top of the tree. Now, within the spring timing, earlier I talked about mineralization and critical points of influence. So these four spring sprays are timed the week of quarter inch green. And I say the week of, I don't try to jump out there early. It might be half inch green or even tight cluster. It, it needs to be warm enough. You know, it's very cool in early spring. So I, I pick a decent day to do it. I try to do holistic sprays on a sunny day before a rain. And the reason for that is that I want photosynthesis to be going full bore. So as the tree is taking in these nutrients, I'm going to get that response a lot quicker. Worried is, and that doesn't mean there's always a sunny day. Sometimes it's a cloudy day because you're still adhering to the bud schedule aspect. Another aspect of this is I grow about 100 varieties of apples. And it isn't like they all are at pink on May 10th and then they all bloom on May 15th. It's spread out. So I, I don't go out and say, oh, you're at pink. This is spring two. Oh, you're at petal fall. Here's spring three. It's, I just average it out and it's, everything gets it. So the very late bloomers, there will be some blossoms that are still open, but it's time for me to get that petal fall spray on. It's, you gotta, you gotta make this reasonable for you as well. Um, so these four bud stages, straddle the season of the primary infection window. Um, I try to get on that pink spray as close to open blossoms as I can. So maybe the early varieties have actually opened a few, but the pink spray is what's going to carry me into the open bloom time when I don't want to apply neem because I don't want to impact the pollinators on blossom. Yes. So the ideal when you are spraying a nutritional spray is to get out there early in the morning before things have gotten too hot and stomates shut down. So that's totally a relevant statement in summer. In spring, if it's getting up to 55, 60, 65, that's not like shutting down at like 80, 85. So it's not like you have to be out there at dawn, though, I'll introduce some ways that you can impress your neighbors. Being out there at dawn can be impressive, um, particularly if you have motorized sprayer. Um, yeah, that's that idea. But my, my main thing is I try to get it done in the morning, but it takes me about probably four or five hours to spray my three acres. And so I'm not going to have everything at the ideal moment. But some sunshine is just going to help the uptake of that. Is there another question? No. Okay. So another thing you'll see in here, the reason I have this logo on the screen, that is Advancing Eco Ag, which is John Kemp's company out in Ohio, who does a lot of work with nutritional sprays. So they have some really great products. Um, again, my goal is not to buy lots of products, but what I do buy, I want to be especially effective. And one of those products, I've been using for several years now is called MicroPack. And MicroPack is kind of a tonic blend of all the trace minerals. So it's not in excess, you're not going to burn things with too much boron, but it, it's providing that shot of cobalt, that shot of molybdenum, and etc. during the critical bud stages. And the where it correlates on this framework, if you look at <coughs> say the petal fall spray. In column three, you see core holistic recipe. So that's all four things on the, in the rates given on the back second page with trace minerals. Trace minerals means that's one of those critical points of influence, whether it's um, the micro pack from AEA or something like sea crop, which is a dehydrated ocean water product without the salt issue that C90 comes with. So sea crop is a better choice there. And again, as you get into this, sea crop is a liquid formulation being shipped from Washington. It's like, does this make sense? I mean, I'm getting micropack shipped from Ohio to New England. That's also 
a liquid product. But you'll get, you'll see. Yeah. So the question is about plant sap analysis, which I've been wanting to do for a couple of years, but there's a, a money factor here. And this is sending leaves that they send to Europe to be analyzed in Denmark, and then you get these results back. So it, it has more meaning than a soil test, and it has more meaning, they say, than a tissue analysis. And it's done at different points in the season to say, I need a charge of this or I need a charge of that. So I really like that and admire it, but it's a bit too much costliness and this shipping to Europe and then now get on the boat and buy this product, now buy this product. What I'm trying to discern in all that is a more tonic approach that makes sense. So the trace minerals make sense at these bud stages to me. And I don't need to prove through plant sap analysis that I really needed cobalt. So maybe, yes, I could get a more specific trace mineral spray, but I'm, I'm trying to be, retain my generalist cook thing and make this functional for small scale orchardists. I mean, if you have 100 acres, that all becomes more economical. And, and if you also are close enough that you're not necessarily shipping all these products, it might make sense. But there's a point where I mean, their spray program, if you go full <coughs> out, has a quite an impressive cost to it. And, and they're good people. It's just this is what they think, they believe, and I'm trying to teach more of a middle course in that respect. We're back to this idea of healthy plant metabolism, meaning the plant can resist the diseased organism longer. And when I told you at 50 degrees, it takes 11 hours of wetting. We're now making it so much harder for the disease to get that foothold that it might take 20 hours of wetting. You know, I, another thing about this research, as good as it is, it was all done with sick trees. No one has ever worked with healthy trees. Healthy trees meaning mycorrhizal fungal connection, no herbicide strip, meaning robust growth and nutritional support. It would, it would reflect a whole different scenario than what you see. But the idea that, okay, I have, the odds are improved so much more because things are going to dry out. My robust tree with that phytochemical defense, not to mention the microbial component, is going to go a long way. So the rates are on that chart and they're on the website. And the rates are important with respect to that neem concentration, with the seed oil concentration. So that's where I'm cutting the neem but a third with karanja, but whether you use all neem or just karanja doesn't so much matter, but 0.5% is important because a higher dose could result in leaf burn. And a higher dose, you may have mixed the proportions correctly, but now let's look at what you're spraying with. And you're spraying with a manual backpack sprayer. Well even emulsified fats rise to the top. So now you have to make sure that you're doing some sloshing. Now remember, the neighbors are washing, watching, so this is good. That contributes to that dynamic. Um, but not only that, you have to really be aware of your attachments. And by your attachments, I mean, <coughs> here's the limb on the Williams Pride tree where your three-year-old son picked his first apple. And it's like, oh, I see William's Pride. I really like this branch. And you're remembering that memory. 12 years ago, your three-year-old picking that out. And you keep spraying it. <coughs> and that triple application now is no longer at 0.5%. And now you see a lot of leaf burn. You did it because you had an attachment. Similarly, or whatever, you got distracted. <laughs> Similarly, um, if you're growing pears, Pears can take spring one and spring two quite readily, but some pear varieties in those couple of weeks right after bloom almost invariably seem to burn. And so <coughs> I either skip those applications or if I do do it, I do it really quick where I might have on an apple done like this so that I'm putting less on. 
Now, I'm going a little deeper here than I mean to. Pears have diseases. There's a thing called pear scab. So if you're growing varieties susceptible to pear scab, you almost want to continue to do this because that's the, the counter. There's an insect that gets after pears called pear blister mite. And if you have that, you almost want to continue to have that neem anti-molting aspect so you start to limit it. But you just have to be careful. And I'm just, that's the way it is with pears. So here I am applying liquid fish, which is being shipped to me, seaweed, which is being shipped to me, um, the microbe culture, which is being shipped to me, though there's alternatives there, and the seed oils, which are being shipped to me. There are alternatives. So like milk contains a lot of fats. Some people work with whey. What I'm pointing out here is, is there's things that you can substitute. Um, when I get into the fermented plant extracts, these are going to be plants that grow in your area. You know, a lot of research is being done with this. You thought it was totally useless. But the, the Osage orange has many antifungicidal qualities. So I'm not eliminating any of that. It's, it's someone else's to discover some of the nuance of how you might work with some of the things that grow in your bioregion. Let's move on to the fruit sizing window. So in the fruit sizing window, we have <coughs> actual insects moving in who want to eat the fruit. So that's those orange bars. Scab is pretty much dissipated, but now cedar apple rust is coming on strong. Fire blight is continuing. But a whole other category of thing is happening. And that is that fruit is set, and on some varieties it has set to excess. And by excess, that's this picture. You see that all five blossoms have been pollinated and there's a fruitlet developing. Now, if you didn't do anything about that, you will grow five golf balls and those golf balls will have a lot of hiding spaces in between and surface feeding moths are likely going to be found within when you pick the golf balls. Similarly, that dense cluster of fruitlets is gonna dry out slower, so disease spotting organisms have a better odds of succeeding on the surface of those little fruitlets. The other thing that is happening is that inside each of those fruitlets is as many as 10 seeds. So that means that that growing point, that spur point where fruit blossom cells develop for next year's crop, the development of 50 seeds leads to really high levels of gibberellic acid hormone, which inhibits the development of next year's flower. So this is why in the wild you see a, a heavy fruit set year on an apple tree and the next year there's no fruit. It isn't like a spring frost took out the blossoms or some insect came and ate every blossom. Those blossoms never developed because there were so many seeds developed on that tree it didn't have the energy to put into flowers. So rather than grow golf balls, I'd rather grow a nice sized fruit, ideally that stands, for the most part, singly rather than clustered together. So I've left moths. I say ideally, I'm gonna explain that. There are always exceptions. That is going to uh, have 10 seeds, but that's not gonna inhibit the development of a flower at that spur point, or if not at that spur point, at the next spur point. So some varieties tend to set almost every flower. And in truth, you only need like 3 to 5% of that canopy of flowers to have a full crop. They just need to be spaced apart so you grow higher quality fruit. And, you know, this becomes more pertinent as a commercial grower, but even as a home orchardist, golf balls aren't quite as nice as a little bit more size than that. And you may not be necessarily as concerned about an annual crop year after year after year because you can put up applesauce, you can put up apple juice, I mean, you can dry apple slices. But it's also nice to have some fruit in that next year because there is an on-year, off-year cycle to apples. With peaches, <coughs> excuse me, thinning isn't relevant in terms of the blossom because the blossom is going to develop on only one-year-old wood. But with peaches, when you have an excess of fruit, the brittle branches readily break off. So you'll grow a nicer sized peach by 
either thrashing the blooms with a brush so you knock some off, and then hand thinning or just relying totally on hand thinning. So in this cluster of five fruitlets, those five flowers did not all open at the same time. There was the center bloom called the king blossom, which opens first, and it's open for a day or two before the next two flowers beside it open. And then another two or three days pass before the third round of flowers open. What the tree is doing is protecting its odds. If there's a frost, it still has some flowers to open. They're more likely, when I said 10% <clears throat> of the blooms are lost at 28 degrees, well, those that are still tightly curled up, they can take like 24, 22 degrees, and that's when they get lost. But it's only when they open that the cold exposure comes into play. So ideally, the king blossom gets pollinated successfully because it has a jump start on the surrounding fruitlets. That's the one ideally to grow. Now, when the five fruitlets are there, you're going to be able to also judge, did something get hit by an insect? Is there a disease spotting on these two fruitlets? And you're going to be able to do some editing and pick the more quality fruitlets so what grows is going to be the nicest apple. To achieve getting return bloom, let me just let me say it this way. It takes between 20 to 40 leaves to be the photosynthesis factory for each fruit to develop fully to what it can be. Now, the reason for that range is that <coughs> 20 reflects a fruit out on the surface of the tree in the direct sunshine. Many of the fruits growing on a dwarf tree have much more direct exposure to sunlight, where with a bigger tree, fruits on the interior don't get as much direct sunlight, and so they need more leaves to achieve the same amount of sugars to go into that development of the fruit. Now, as a, a fruit grower, I have never, like, thinned off, left one apple, counted 20 leaves, thinned off to one apple. You don't count leaves, but you, you have a sense of it takes a certain amount of leaves for photosynthesis to happen. That's to develop the fruit. If you want the return flower, Russian research points to it being more like 60 to 70 leaves per fruit. So what does that look like on the tree? Because we're not going to count leaves. If every blossom cluster, which are usually two to four inches apart, has those five flowers, you can start by removing clusters in between, leaving fruitlets spaced more like five to eight inches apart. And then if, you, if everything's set heavily throughout, you thin that down to the one best looking apple. And if you can, you pick the biggest of them, which will be the king blossom. Then you get the appearance of, of the branch there. That's actually not thinned enough um, for return bloom. That's thinned enough to grow really great apples and pick a lot of fruit, but it's still kind of heavy for guaranteeing return bloom. So I say on average, <coughs> thin to six to eight inches apart. That's a good rule of thumb. But I say on average because what if it was a sporadic fruit set and you have <coughs> a branch here with a fairly good set or you have some doubles but not five apples? You then can leave those doubles in place. It depends on the variety. They, they vary with what they are. And now you're kind of thinking a little bit more about the leaves. Um, if you're a cider maker, it's rare that you thin. You accept the golf ball size fruit. Or there are spray ways to thin, and we're going to look at that. Is there a question? OK. Oh, no, wait. <laughs> that last bit, the pest populations. So there's a number of, of insects that larvae go into the seed cavity, and they want to. <coughs> take the nutrition of the seed cavity and then the fruitlet will abort and drop to the ground and then they want to get into the larva, into the soil to pupate to come back the next year. So when you're thinning in this 30 to 40 day window called the fruit sizing window, and if it's an orchard you're taking over and no one's done anything to balance out pest populations or it's, it's just built up in your young orchard now that you had more and more fruit, it's really worthwhile because you're plucking the apple off the tree, to put it in a bucket or put it into a sack 
and destroy those fruitlets. How do you destroy them? You might have pigs. You might have chickens. You can throw it into their stall. If you're going to compost it, you have to be sure it's a hot pile, not a static pile where the applets roll to the down off the pile and then the larva gets into the ground anyway. One of the things that happened in Lost Nation, when I had a least orchard and we were cleaning up pest pop pressure, was these big brown spots would appear on the road. And what they were was me dropping a five gallon bucket of fruitlets on the way home in the evening. And then all the cars going over it, everything smashed. But it was a lot like crop circles. People didn't know. I mean, it was just some kind of alien moving in. But that's the thinking, you know? This is what you get into. You have such a future. It's, it's going to be good. Um, so there are ways for organic-minded growers to spray thin. So IPM growers have synthetic hormones. And they use those in conjunction with an insecticide called Carbaryl, which is sold under the trade name Seven. Um, somehow that insecticide Seven acts as a photosynthetic inhibitor and helps abort more fruitlets. It's complicated, but when I say Carbaryl, I think of 1980, I believe is the year, in Bhopal, India, when thousands of people were killed by a chemical cloud that got out into the streets of Bhopal. Um, that's not something I want to do. <laughs> that's not in my arsenal of materials. On the other hand, blossoms can be smothered with something like vegetable oil. Some growers will use table salt to burn the blossom. Molasses works in a similar way, potassium bicarbonate as well. And what's done is, and, and this is more you wouldn't do this to every tree in your orchard. You would do it to heavy setters. And you have to go, in this case, by the bud stage. You, d you don't average it out. So king blossom opens, let's say, and so heavy setters are things like Gala and Fuji. You'll recognize a lot of supermarket varieties in this category. Paula Red is another heavy setter. Um, king blossom opens, and it's a great bee day. You see bee activity, and the bees are delivering pollen. A pollen tube starts to grow down to the ovaries where the seed will be developed. And that pollen tube is essentially a done deal. The flower's still there, it's still open, but the bees delivered a, a day if you're feeling really bold, two days for sure, and then you come in as the second round of blossoms open and you spray one of these materials to destroy those flowers. It's also going into the open king blossom but the package has been delivered. It's in the pollen tube. There's a lot of faith involved with this. You'll, you'll have to ease into it. And again, it, it's only for super heavy setting varieties and the fact that you have a significant amount of them because you're growing commercially. But you're not going to do this as a home orchardist. Um, the other method is where you get involved with taking off the fruitlets. So with the blossoms, there's a leap of faith. You can't see that that's actually been pollinated. You just think it was pollinated. And in this method, it involves the typical combination is fish oil and lime sulfur. And when the fruitlets are probably about seven, eight days after petal fall, that spray application is made. This also comes with complications. So there's ways to lessen the amount of fruitlets you have to remove by hand. But you can see that it's a labor intensive thing, but of, of high value. So during this period, spray applications are tightened up. I don't want to miss anything. You know, June is a very important month. Um, this is when I'm going to begin the applications of silica and calcium from the plant extracts. You can buy those as products. I'm going to talk about why in just a minute. But this is also when the pest overlap happens. So this is a period where really 80% of your prime fruit work is done and brings the crop in, and it's really not a period to be missed. This is not when you go on the vacation. This is not when you go golfing on weekends. This is when you're, you're dedicated to your trees. The fruit white ripening window, uh, we get into the summer months. And again, the wetter it is, the more rots might be an issue. And this whole business about silica and calcium is about 
beefing up the cuticle defense behind that waxy layer. So healthy plant metabolism, metabolism, four times the amount of lipids, builds up a stronger cuticle without cracks. That's really important. Having competitive microbes on the surface is the first line of defense. But behind the cuticle, behind where a rot might get through a crack or through damage done by an insect, are the epidermal cell wall and that's where the calcium and silica comes into play. And I do that by working with specific plants that grow in my ecosystem. Now, there's other plants that could be used for this as well. And I got into this because my wife, Nancy's an herbalist. I learned how you do a tea infusion to draw the nutrition out and it made a lot of sense to me. And so the plants that I work with are things like horsetail, which botanically is known as Equisetum arvens. Um, Steiner biodynamic growers use this slightly differently than I do. But horsetail has its first manifestation as a plant. It looks like a mushroom. That's the male part. Um, it sporulates to produce more horsetail. The second part of the plant has these vertical, I'll call them tines, fronds that as the plant grows, start to flatten, and it looks like a brushy horsetail. And when those fronds start to flatten, levels of silica go shooting up in the plant, which is going to correlate to the growth stage when I'm collecting it. Another plant I use, and some of you are going to get into this, and some of you are going to skip it, some of you are going to go to AEA, and you'll buy your calcium and silica products. There's different ways to go about it, but you'll see the relevance in just a minute. Nettle is a plant that herbalists say, if in doubt about a certain condition, give someone nettle, because there's so many green tonic phytochemicals in there that it's just going to help the body system as a whole. So nettle is, is a, one of our crops. We cut it in the green stage when it's about 8, 10 inches tall, and we dry it for tea, because it has all those phytonutrients. In the green stage, very high in calcium and, and, and other specific nutrients needed by plant. But nettle, when it goes beyond that and starts to go to seed, starts to get high levels of silica. So I distinguish green nettle from seeded nettle when we get to the fermented plant extracts. The comfrey plants that I'm growing for all those good reasons have a lot of calcium in their leaves. And calcium is a, a nutrient that not only do I want to get a good calcium baseline, I'm going to use foliar calcium. Many growers do foliar calcium applications. So my, my initial work with plant extracts, I did the different herbs in their own five-gallon buckets, and I poured hot water on to help break the tea. I was doing like a tea. I'm going to change how I do that. But, but the idea was that by sitting for seven to ten days, the con plant material would break down, it would start to ferment, and the con constituents, the phytonutrients, would come out into the liquid. So when, when I'm talking about herbal teas, fermented plant extracts, I'm not trying to fill the volume of water with microbes. I'm tr trying to fill the volume of water with nutrients. On top of some of those buckets, you see garlic scapes. So all this is happening right after bloom. The plants are in their right growth stage. I grow hard neck vi garlic, so you, you snap the scape off so that more of the energy goes into the bulb. You make garlic pesto with the scapes. You feed scapes to your sheep to help with any potential worms. But I also use them in the teas, so we'll do a quick little herbal medicine sidebar. Garlic has all kinds of medicinal virtues. One of those is, is it's a really excellent expectorant, by which I mean it helps get phlegm out of the lungs. So when you're really congested, garlic is something that's going to help clear that up. So you can understand that as an adult. And you can chew on garlic or have garlic in your miso soup or various ways of preparing garlic. And it's going to help that expectorant aspect. But when you're a parent and you have a one-year-old or a two-year-old who's all congested, you can't rationalize garlic. They don't want to eat garlic. Um, if you try to put it in honey and put it on toast, they know it. So what you have to do is understand how garlic works. And if you take a clove of garlic and you dip it in 
olive oil to mellow it out and you rub it in the base of the foot of an infant, about 10 to 20 seconds later, you're going to smell garlic coming out here. And that's because the organa sulfur compounds in garlic are really good at passing through a membrane. So when I add this property to my fermented plant extracts, I'm putting a plant medicine in there that's going to carry the calcium and silica through the membrane. Again, some of you are going to be into this. Some of you are just letting seeds land all around you and you're, you're thinking about whatever you're thinking about right now. What I've come to do is I make barrels of fermented plant extracts, one that's focused on the calcium side, the other that's focused on the silica side. I don't have to do these differently, I just do because I need that volume of tea to apply to my orchard according to my plan here with the spray schedule. What's really cool here is it's homegrown. What I'm doing costs less than a dollar per gallon without shipping costs. Um, the pure guy essence thing, when you work with plant material that you let ferment, there's some strong smell aspects to it. And you just have to be tuned into the fact that after you've sprayed, you probably shouldn't go directly to town. <laughs> I, I have. and. It's better to make sure you change and jump in the pond before you go to town. Um, what I do here is I have the comfrey and the green nettle and the calcium brew. I add four gallons of whole milk. doesn't have to be raw milk, but whole milk. Again, it's the fats. I do add two gallons of effective microbes to get things going because I want those lactic acid bacteria. I also appreciate the nature of facultative organisms. So. There's going to be microbes in whatever you do because it was on the plant, but I definitely want to get things going. So using the microbes, not so much to populate the volume with microbes, but just to get the process going. There's the garlic scapes. I will use different soil amendments as well. So in, in the barrel for calcium, I'll throw two to four pounds of gypsum. Gypsum is calcium sulfate. It's going to break down and go into the solution hold on the humic acids. I'll explain that. In the silica brew, it's the horsetail and the seeded nettle. If you're in a place where horsetail doesn't grow, let's say you're in a place where bamboo grows. Bamboo is very rich in silica. You're in a place where stiff marsh grasses grow. They're stiff because they have lots of silica. There's, so there's different things you can use if you go this route. The microbes again. Now I use something like azomite clay or basalt dust because they're high in silica. And the way I go about this is I'm brewing next to my compost operation. Seven, nine days pass and I fork out all the herbal material into the compost. When I do that, it's totally tanned out. All the green goodness has gone into solution. And then when I go at that point is when I add the humic acids. And the humic acid essentially chelates the minerals that have been put into the solution so they are on a, a site on the molecules that can be grabbed and that nutrient can be taken up by the plant. I'll, I'll explore that a little bit more tomorrow. Um, but it also stabilizes the brew. Similarly, I can add humic acid if I want to hold effective microbes, activated effective microbes through the winter. So humic acids have those two properties. They stabilize the brew and they chelate the mineral nutrition so it's bioavailable to the plant. On the day I want to spray, um, you'll see where it says silica tea, calcium tea at certain applications. It's not everywhere. It's, it's really more the fruit sizing window and calcium continues into the summer sprays. On those days I want to spray, I pour the bucket through a quarter inch strainer and then that bucket is poured through a more micro mesh strainer in my sprayer because I don't want whatever plant parts are still in the liquid to clog my sprayer and in each hundred gallon tank I'm going to do five gallons of calcium tea and five gallons of silica tea. So again this sounds like way overboard and complicated but if you're doing it and you're into the cycle and, and you just are aware of the virtues of, of plant medicines it's a, a really cool thing. So here, here's a picture of 
of those summer diseases. This is, is mostly sooty blot, so I see a little fly speck on there. These are fungi that are feeding on the waxy cuticle. So the fact that I continue to add biology in the sprays during this period makes it a more competitive dynamic. Not all of them are going to get their dibs in on that cuticle. But the thing about these fungi is they don't penetrate the skin. They don't go into the flesh. And so if you spit on an apple, rub it on your shoulder, you mostly get rid of the blemish that shows. Now on a yellow or green apple, it's still going to look discolored in the skin because there was some shading on that apple. But you know, when you sell apples, there's a limit on how many apples you're allowed to spit on. And so <laughs> for me, it's worthwhile trying to prevent, lessen the amount of this that takes place. And I find that through the, the teas and the microbes, I get there. This is what the cuticle looks like on the surface of different types of plants. It's like snowflakes. Every plant has its own cuticle formation. Now just visualize your spraying. And the fats are being absorbed into that cuticle, but also penetrating through, going down to the cells. The microbes are lodging in all these nooks and crannies. They're not going to wash off. An application of the holistic core recipe is a lot different than applying something like sulfur, which will wash off. It, it goes, it's systemic and it embeds in this cuticle. And underneath that cuticle are the epidermal cells, the surface cells on the leaf and on the fruit. And what happens is calcium goes into the epidermal cells and toughens it so the rot fungi can't punch through there. And then that space between the epidermal cells, that's where silica lodges and it forms something called a phytolith. And again, the rot fungi can't go through there. So between beefing up the cuticle and beefing up the epidermal cell wall and these silica phytoliths, you see a whole lot less rots. And again, this becomes really important in a super wet summer. If you're not commercial, maybe you're not thinking about this so much. Or you recognize, OK, I'm not going to do the tea, but that business with the milk. I'm going to do some summer holistic sprays, and I'm going to add a shot of milk. And, and I list some alternatives on that second page. So it can be simple. It can be You can do this dance with the herbs. You can buy products. But hopefully you're getting an understanding there's certain purposes for certain things. And if that's your issue, then maybe that's something that you're going to work with. This is what brown rot looks like. Um, different ty all types of stone fruits are subject to it. And I'm going to remind you that brown rot is just not the fruit stage. Remember back to that cycle, overwinters and twig lesions. If you're commercial, maybe you're doing a copper application early to deal with that. Then it goes and infects blossom clusters. So the spring sprays are relevant on the stone fruits. The less infested blossom clusters, the less spores to come and get the fruit. It's, it's complex. But it can be broken down and understood, and, and, and we have a plan. And again, just to bring up different ideas, one of the herbs we grow is a berry plant, a vine plant from China, schizandra. Uh, schizandra berries are said to contain all the five tastes, sweet and salty and sour and bitter, and I can't remember the fifth. Um, and <clears throat> as a remedy, they're useful for increasing longevity. They're considered to be a very potent aphrodisiac. There's, there's many things that you can do with schizandra. Nancy does a uh, kombucha with the schizandra. <laughs> Almost made a joke about my wife and the aphrodisiac thing, but I stopped myself. <laughs> you don't know that, but if you do this thing, you talk in public, it's like this, the guy talking, and then there's the guy watching the guy talking. And then sometimes he like sneaks in and makes some comment, which isn't supposed to come out. But that happens, especially as we go longer into the day. Um, yeah, so there's, there's different ways. It, it's a fascinating thing we work with, but we're working with the same principles. I, you know, on that same note, as you get into herbal medicine, it's, it's just so effective. And 
again, to be able to work with the plants that help you heal your children and help you heal people that are your friends. It's, it's an amazing thing to get involved with. So here's a picture of, of bitter pit on a, I believe that's a Cortland apple. Um, it starts as kind of sunken spots, but then brown and get stiff and hard and, and have a little corkiness to the flesh right behind them. And it's all about an imbalance of the cations that get into the leaves. So right, right now I'm moving beyond the idea of cation balance in the soil with lime to the fact that I'm using some calcium spray. I might use Epsom salt for magnesium if I'm in a weak magnesium situation. And one of the things in a tonic sense that I've learned from John Kemp is that manganese chelate really helps balance foliar applications of calcium magnesium and it helps balance it by making sure the potassium factor is corrected, whether you have excess or deficient potassium. So as a home orchardist, you're not going to go here. But when I do the calcium silica teas, I now include the manganese chelate as well. That's another like core tonic product that I buy. And again, this is part of my living, so it's important to me to see less bitter pit, to have stronger storing fruit because it gets the right levels of calcium. And the other thing about manganese is it's really important in the formation of fruit buds. So when I'm making these applications in the fruit sizing windows with the teas, you will, that's exactly when fruit buds are forming. So if you've had some issues with return bloom, weak return bloom or buds not surviving, part of what you need to do is boost that nutritional aspect. And it's, it's a combination of the calcium, the magnesium, and manganese that are key there. Okay, we're into the, are we into? Yes, the final hour. So we'll sprint to the finish line. We have more to cover than an hour will give us, but we need to know about fire blight. Because again, this is, this is not just losing your crop that year. This is potentially about losing your trees. Um, apple, pear trees even more, um, and quince, are subject to fire blight, stone fruit or not. So this is not a peach thing, this is not a cherry thing. Yes? We're gonna get there with some slides, but we're gonna look at the genetic piece. Let, let's just start, so there, there's a number of different bacterial diseases, bacterial canker is very relevant on stone fruit. That's not an apple thing, but if you're in a wet place like the Pacific Northwest, bacterial canker becomes a real issue. Bacteria, unlike fungi, fungi have strategies. They either produce enzymes that help a hyphae punch through the leaf cell, or the rot organism punches through the cuticle and then the leaf cell, or even cedar apple rust goes through the stomate. There's a strategy aspect to it. Fire blight requires an opportunity. It doesn't make its opportunity. It requires that that opportunity be presented. And the primary vector for fire blight is every time an apple bud opens into a flower. That's a direct opening into the vascular system of the tree. Another opening for fire blight in the month following blossom time, shoots are whipped by the wind or they're torn by a tremendous downpour or hail strikes or insects to the tips of shoot ends. All that becomes an opening into the vascular system of the tree. Fire blight requires certain conditions. So high 70s, eight, low 80s and up, and it's moist, those are fire blight conditions. If you have a cool blossom season, let's say it doesn't get above 70, you're not worried about fire blight. But if it's warm and it's moist and bloom season is stretched out so some part of it experiences the right conditions, you have to be tuned in. The issue is that a lot of the very sweet varieties grown today commercially that you find in the supermarket are very susceptible to fire blight, on top of which the rootstock they've been put on in dwarf orchards, the M9 and a few others, are also very susceptible. So blight gets into the blossom and quickly goes through the vascular system to a root system that doesn't have much resistance. 
some of the things that you can do to prevent that kind of total tree loss is working with more resistant varieties and rootstocks. So you will see these charts that talk about these varieties are more resistant to fire blight. What that means is that those are varieties that can compartmentalize the damage. The bacteria will still get in. Um, but if conditions are right, even something with that skill set can be subject to disease getting in through so many points that it's impossible to cut that off. So fire blight resistance with respect to open blossoms is a questionable thing. With respect to the rootstock, um, there is a series of rootstock called the Geneva series. This was developed in Geneva, New York. And what they did was they sprouted specific crosses of, of apples, had tens of thousands of seedlings, and they gave, deliberately gave them fire blight. And only the survivors were then tested for rootstock and different degrees of vigor. So if you work with a Geneva series rootstock, like G41 is, is a 30% size tree. G935 is like a 45% tree. G860 is like a 55, 60% size tree. Those rootstock have more resistance. And, and certainly there are varieties that have more resistance in that compartmentalized way. Extremely vigilant, vigilant sanitation, I'll explain that with the next slide. If you had a lot of fire blight the previous year, on this growth stage on this chart in the bud swell window, um, that copper application has relevance to throwing blue pianos into all these bud crevices and cracks in the bark so that when fire blight bacteria disseminate into that launching stage to get into the open blossoms, a lot of them are just done in by the fact that you really emphasize the blue copper toxicity. toxicity. Um, and then we'll get to antibiotics. So first, the sanitation part. So when fire blight gets into a flower, if you're paying attention, you'll see these watery, oozy blossoms. You snap those blossom clusters off. There's no tool involved. You just snap them off because the infection, and all the more when it's warm, will rapidly move down the branch into bigger tissue and form cankers. And it can also come into the shoot vector. But when it does that, a canker is like the line of where the bark has been damaged, diseased, and that's as far as the blight has gotten, and then it's healthy. And if you prune, eight to 10 inches below that, you pretty much are removing the infection that got into the vascular system. But what you do is, is, is you learn to leave a stub that you're gonna come back in the winter months and make the proper cut at a branch juncture. But that stub, the ugly stub, probably got reinfected because where you pruned it off, that's an opening into the vascular system of the tree. But you slowed it down, it doesn't have that rampant jump start and then you remove it in the cooler dormant season when infection isn't gonna reoccur. Um, fire blight typically starts in a shoot by turning it brown and it crooks over. That crept shepherd's crook is, is a sign of, of fire blight. And bacteria being opportunistic, they don't like competition. And therein lies the answer. So back in the 90s, researchers in Utah started to put Pseudomonas bacteria in the entrance to honeybee hives. And the honeybees, by crawling through the Pseudomonas bacteria and flying out pollinate the flowers, were delivering a specific package of competitive microbes into every blossom that they touched. And they learned that that was a really incredible way to effectively limit fire blight to very acceptable levels. And so this, this idea of microbes being delivered to the flowers, today there are spray products you can buy. One of them is called Blight Ban, which is Pseudomonas bacteria. Another is called Blossom Protect, which is two strains of yeast, yeast bacteria. They're ineffective microbes. 
And that's where I go with what I call the competitive colonization booth. Again, I'm the home cook. I could pay $75 an acre for an application of Blossom Protect, and typically you have to spray it two or three times in the bloom window to cover the whole flow of the flowers that are opening. That's a lot of money. I, I'd rather, I bought the microbes, I activated them. I have the um, Karanja oil, I have the seaweed that I bought in bulk. And so what I call the competitive colonization booth, there's no fish, there's no, there's no fish because I don't want oil smothering flower parts. There's no neem because I don't want azadiractins impacting pollinators. I do use some Karanja oil to help spread the microbes and provide fat to seed, but I use it at half the rate that I normally do. I double the rate of microbes. I increase the rate of seaweed because seaweed has those cytokinins, which have the flavonoids, which are antibacterial. So that combination of things, the molasses is optional. That combination of things is competitive colonization. And I'm only doing this if conditions are right. And if conditions are right the whole <coughs> bloom period time, I might do it at king bloom time, I might do it three days in, I might do it five or seven days in. So I might do it two or three times if conditions are right the whole time. But that's, that's a rare event in northern New England. Down here, it's going to be a more common event. Um, and again, if, if you're doing the holistic approach, use the things you now have on hand, it's just we shift the recipe. It's a different purpose. We've got a different goal going on. My friend Eric, uh, Redbird Cider, outside Ithaca, New York, is growing a lot of the bittersweets and the bitter sharps that come from Europe. So when you're a hard cider maker, you want the tannin. And some of these European varieties are showing very limited resistance to fire blight. So he goes a step more allopathic and uses a copper soap, which is a lot less impactful than a copper sulfate, a dormant copper used at bud swell stage just on those specific varieties. So again, you, you, you fine tune your system to what you're growing, how your marketing works, your product, but also your site. It's, it's all variable, this whole spray framework. You mostly repeat things every year, but there's variable parts that you don't repeat every year. The copper part, early in spring, bud swell. You've got to have a specific reason. You don't just do it. It's, it's you learn the disease and, and then you address what's happening. Out in Washington, their approach to both fire blight and bacterial canker is using hops resin. And the resin of hops is very antibacterial. And th they combine this with vegetable oil, some kelp, some molasses, and some yucca extract. Apply it every 10 to 14 days before bloom through the bloom period and maybe one shot after because of the shoot blight possibility. And they're having great success. So again, it's what are the resources in the place you're growing in? Maybe you have a friend growing hops for the beer makers, but there's this resin aspect and, and you could utilize it. There's different ways to go about it. About eight years ago now, the creator decided that this, this guy in northern New Hampshire needed a lesson. And this guy in northern New Hampshire owns like 57 acres. And for five minutes, golf ball sized hail landed on his 57 acres. And it seemed like it didn't land anywhere outside the border of this guy in northern New Hampshire's property. And my orchard was literally stripped of its leaves. My garlic was flattened. Windows on our house were broken. Some of you have probably been in that kind of hailstorm. Um, and every one of the tears in the bark was an opportunity for fire blight. I was very broken hearted. You know, this is some fruit growers give it up when they experience this kind of thing and totally understandable. But I went out and I did the holistic spray and then I wasn't able to go into the orchard for about a week or so. But I didn't see fire blight because I colonized all those wounds with good microbes. This works. Then there, there are all sorts of cankers that can occur to, to the trunk and the limbs of trees cankers. So they can be bacterial, they can be fungal. This particular one is called a perennial canker. And what happens is there's an organism in there that causes 
the callous tissue that's trying to cover that wound to stop growing. And then the tree wards it off, and there's like this back and forth battle. And so you get concentric, concentric rings of callus that form. To change that dynamic, you need to go back to the lesson of the chestnut tree. So there's something called biodynamic tree paste, and it's a mixture of, at its simplest, half clay and half some source of microbe. Biodynamic growers say you want fresh cow manure. Compost works equally well. And the idea is that the clay helps with healing qualities to grow that callus, but it's the microbe that kick the pathogen out of the canker. They take over the niche, it changes the dynamic. Now think of this as an earth poultice. But you're getting the idea that things that are around us are the medicine to solve issues. So we've got all those natural advantages in the morning, and we've been taking care of disease. The one piece I haven't really touched on is that fall hygiene idea. And the more, yes? Okay, so if I'm pruning in the dormant season, and I see, and it's in an orchard where there was a number of fire blight strikes, and I see a living canker by which I can, it isn't all dried up and cracked open. It, it's got a, you might even see some ooze coming out of it in early spring. If I'm pruning and I see that, I take that out. Um, I ship it to Idaho, or maybe I'll start shipping it to you. But uh, I take, because it's just common sense. To drop that on the ground when it's in its still vibrant stage, it's still going to throw those bacteria out. On the other hand, in the winter, I out, it's mostly pretty dry, and just throwing it in the brush pile that gets chipped changes the, I chip before the fire blight season starts, and I don't worry about it. So, uh, so I'm not stu super strict about it, but I am conscious that if it's an active canker, and particularly if I see ooze, it's better to get that section of the limb out of there. And that section of the limb, meaning, let's say, eight foot of branch died because of this fire blight canker, well, out there, it's not active. It's right at the edge of the canker where the active part is. So yes, in that sense, spring hygiene, pruning hygiene, that's the story. Right now, I'm talking about managing those leaves that need to be decomposed. And rather than use a word like fall hygiene or orchard sanitation, I, I like to say I stir the biological stew in the fall. And in doing this, I want to definitely do three of these four things. So if it's three or four years later after I've adjusted, added lime, got the pH in the right place, and I do a follow-up soil test and it says, oh, we're getting a little more acid again, you should do a maintenance rate of lime. I wait to do that until the fall. So about, let's say, 25, 35% of the leaves have come off the tree. And that's because lime on the surface of those fallen leaves alters the ability of scab to form those spore sacs. So this is research done in Oregon, and th they can lessen the return of scab by 50 to 90% simply by liming. You don't need lime every year, so it's only when you need it take advantage of that timing because it's going to help you. Mowing. I mentioned how in the fall we do a more thorough fall mowing. This is with that brush mower on the BCS. And that's really aimed at chopping up leaves because the more the leaves are chopped and flipped and turned over, the less likely they're going to overwinter. The microbes are going to break that down and decompose it. We talked about spreading compost. So now maybe 50, 60 percent of the leaves are off some of the early and mid-season varieties, and I'm spreading the compost. Anything under compost is gone. It's not going to be a source of inoculum. But the principal thing is that fall holistic spray. And, and now, and you'll see that the rates change. You know, I'm, I'm using liquid fish. It's got the nitrogen piece. IPM growers use urea for this purpose. Nitrogen is just going to make it digestion that much more robust. The fats in the fish and the neem, it's like slathering butter, both on the leaves that have fallen, but any leaves still on the tree. 
and the fats are also going to be absorbed into the bark. The fats are also going to help against extreme cold and wind desiccation in the winter months. It just makes for a more supple bark. And the neem as well, with its azoduractin, is also going to get into bud scales and into curly bark places for things like toddling moth over winter. So I'm not thinking about one specific thing here. This whole collage of goodness is happening to set me up for the next season. Now this was a year when I ran the gas out of our rotary mower we use on the lawn and I just ran a circle around to create a picture that has that idea of creating a fungal duck cake under the trees. I'm so ready for winter. So many good things are in place to establish that next season. I mentioned peach leaf curl, that it overwinters in the bud, so you do that copper spray early in spring. Um, this slide is about, I'm here, it's February, almost March, so you didn't do any of that fall stuff I just mentioned. So what can you do going into spring? Well, it turns out that all those scab stacks, scab that's four sacks have developed pointing up. So this is the solution for the comp obsessive compulsive. You can go out in the orchard and flip every leaf over, and then the spores will go be driven into the ground. I don't think anyone does that either, but you might have some kind of mower that sucks things up and flips things. So you, you can have some impact, but you can also get off to a good start with spring sprays, and some of them are put on the ground. You know, in all these different diseases, it, it doesn't matter. Someone was asking me about black knot on prunus species. That's that gnarly growth that develops on plums and cherries, and some varieties more so than others, some are resistant. And you have to prune it out, but out there in the wild are the pin cherries and the black cherries that have black knot and the wild plums, and it blows in on spores. And it blows in pretty much the end of bloom till about three, four weeks after petal fall. And if you're doing the holistic sprays as listed here, you're addressing black knot. It doesn't matter what disease. Um, there's a launching pad and there's a primary infection window. And you boost the tree, you are now working with changing the dynamics within rather than trying to medicate from without. It, it's, it sounds complex, but it's so simple. It, it's the way organism life on Earth works. So let's talk about genetics a little bit. It's, it's pretty uh, profound to be so near Purdue where the mother tree first grew. What is the mother tree? Somewhere in the early 1900s, people noticed that this apple tree in the campus of Purdue could not get apple scab. And it was the Malus floribunda species. It wasn't necessarily an edible apple. I, I don't. Some of you might know, some of you might have walked by the mother tree. I have not met the mother tree. But anyway, it turned out that the genetics of this tree can make, contained what is called the VF gene, which when an apple cultivar that contains the VF gene, when that spore lands on the leaf and sends a typhi punched through the skin of a cell to access nutrients, that cell has a hypersensitive response to that penetration and just dies. And so the hyphae has used up its energy to get nutrients out of what is now a dead cell, and so there's no future. That's what scab immune cultivars do. That's how they work. But it turned out that these, and so from there, people did deliberate crosses, and they created varieties I told you about the PRI, like Rose Prize, Pride and Enterprise, Gold Rush is a cultivar, Liberty, Freedom, Nova Spy, Nova Mac out of the Nova Scotia Research Station. All of them are based on the genetics of this particular mother tree with the VF gene. Um, it turned out that these varieties couldn't, didn't work in Europe because they had different races of scab. Here in North America, there's approximately five or six races of scab. On top of that, and the same is true for fire blight. It's not all the same fire blight in all the places. So if someone in Louisiana tells you 
I grow this pear and it doesn't get any fire blight. And you go and grow it in Virginia, it might get fire blight because it's a different fire blight. Are you following me with that? Similarly, with these scab resistant varieties, so all through the 70s, 80s, 90s, people would say the way to go organic is planting scab in the cultivar. And there were a lot of scenarios where someone had a scab resistant block, but then they had a traditional block of heirloom types and other apples. And what they did was they didn't spray the scab resistant block. Why do that? Because they don't get scab. And they sprayed sulfur, which is an organic scenario. Or maybe it was a IPM orchard. They also didn't spray the scab and cultivars, didn't need to. And what they did was create this incredible opportunity for scab to evolve a mechanism around the DFC. And so it was approximately eight or 10 years ago that the mother tree, which had 100 years of no scab, started getting scab. And now these cultivars in different locations are getting scab. So what I say is, you know, if you really like red three, that's the picture, apple picture here, which seems like a really stupid name, doesn't it? It's like, mm -hmm. what, why is that apple three red? It looks really red to me, um, but that's the name. If you really like red three, you should grow it because you really like it. You know, some of like Enterprise, um, I find it has much too thick of a skin. I don't, I don't enjoy it. I'll, I'll use it as a cooking apple, but I don't tend to eat it as a fresh apple. And if you start to understand plant immune function, the world opens up to the opportunity to grow all these varieties you really love and, and a chance of success. And, I, and I'm not saying every variety is right for every site. That's not the case. You know, as we've gotten into breeding, we've taken varieties we really like. And the result of that is we've narrowed the genetic brace. So now people have gone back to Kazakhstan where the apple comes from. People are working with red flesh varieties and starting, some people are working with the idea that we don't even want to graft, it should be a season tree. That's, there's an interesting book coming out in a few months from my publisher on that concept. Um, the idea of breeding Kazakhstan apples or something like Worcester Permain genetics into an apple to create a broader horizontal resistance is more effective than a narrow gene that has that hypercellular response. So we're going to talk about insects. I'm going to up the pace a little bit. Um, we planted a tree. We did all this nice work with ramiel chip wood. We added azomite clay. We start to grow apples. And now we start to see some damn insect that destroys most of the crop. So of course, we're angry. And we want to find something to deal with that insect. And that mentality has led us down paths that aren't necessarily the best in the long run, but it's totally understandable. And so with an insect, we have to know who did it, because only by knowing who did it can we look at its life cycle and identify places where we might be able to nudge it back, not ne necessarily kill it completely, but nudge it back to a tolerable level. So sometimes that means you see the insect in action. and. and <clears throat> that gives you a clue, but mostly it's going to be about scarring you see on your fruit. So the scar here in the front looks like a fan shape. The actual story there is that a little weevil called the plum cuculeo, which is about just over an eighth of an inch long, inserted an egg into the flesh of the apple, and then it turned around and it cut a little crescent scar around the egg in order to slow down the growth of the fruit cells so the egg would have time to develop and become a larva. And when that egg gets crushed and or is infertile, then the scar, and this is typical of many feeding things, develops like a raised russet surface. And that little fan is an indication that you're dealing with plum cuculeo. Now the other one, the winding trail, has anyone ever seen that winding trail on an apple in Indiana? Not necessarily. It's coming. This is called the European apple sawfly. And it is definitely in Ohio. It's coming. You have a few more years of a honeymoon period with that one. But that winding scar was made when a little larva scratched its way across the surface of a pea-sized fruit. And then it grew out because it didn't go into the seed cavity. And that leaves you with this scar that says, 
you have soft life. Now you have to learn about what do you do about soft life. <coughs> so in any insect life cycle, we're looking for a point of vulnerability. That's the point when we can make a dent. We can shift something that's going on. Uh, in the case of <coughs> surface feeding caterpillars, moth larvae of things like red banded leaf roller, oblique banded leaf roller, green pug moth, that list goes on and on. There's dozens. I call them all bud moths. They're feeding on the surface of the plant when buds are just popping and leaves are unfurling and they're swallowing green tissue. And that means if you apply something like Bacillus thuringiensis at the tight cluster to pink bud stage, this is BT, sold under a product names like Dipel. BT is very specific to caterpillars. It acts as a protein toxin that dissolves the stomach well, wall and the insect stops feeding. So BT is not that useful against codling moth that immediately goes into the fruit when it hatches. That's an a flex, an interior type moth. It's really effective against surface feeding moth. And on this chart, there's an orange block here. And it says, in the spring tube spray, add BT, because it's just such incredible timing to knock back these moths. And by doing it then, and I will say, I look at my buds and my leaves. If I don't see any chewing, <coughs> and I don't see leaves that are curled on themselves, so have you ever seen a curled leaf and you unfurl it, you'll find a little caterpillar in there? Um, you know, a little of that is not a super issue, but often it's a fairly strong presence because there's so many species that do this. And even then it's not of concern except if they all succeed in pupating and come back in the summer as adult moths and lay their eggs again, that's when you see the second generation. And that's where those apples that were touching each other, they look perfect and you pick them off the tree and on the back hidden side, you see all this chewing. And had you done the BT spray, you'd see so much less of this. So that simple step ties to the fact that they're ingesting folate to take in this biological toxin, which breaks down rapidly, but you're delivering it exactly when they're feeding. That's the point of vulnerability. So we go on to fruit set. And this is the point where insects that are going to eat that seed cavity come into play. So I won't dwell on sawfly, but it has an interesting point of vulnerability. And this is a, <coughs> it's actually a pollinizer, and it lays one egg at the base of the blossom cluster with a chemical signal telling the next female, go to the next cluster. So it's very effective. And when you get sawfly, you can lose like 35% of your crop to this insect. Uh, but its point of vulnerability, it's attracted to the white of blossom. So the white sticky card hung at pink, which seems to disappear into the blossom when the, everything opens up, can capture 40 to 60 sawflies. So in your early years, that's an effective tool. It becomes a point of vulnerability that you can utilize. Once sawfly gets more established, then there's other things that come into play. Um, again, you're going to have access to these slides, so I'm just ignoring the fact that you're taking notes. <laughs> um, this is Plum Cuculeo. This is a North American native that migrated from plum thickets and said, yep, I can do apples. Yep, I can do pears. Yep, I can do cherries. Yep, I can do blueberries. Yep, I can do peaches. And depending where you are in the country, really folks zones in on certain crops. And when twilight temperatures hover around 70, it gets super active. Each female is laying three to four eggs a night, and both males and females are making feeding stains. So when I showed you that crescent scar, that's an egg-laying scar, the other typical scar of Cuculeo is, imagine this is the size of a marble, an apple fruit is, and they make a feeding sting here, suck some sap. That point where they stuck their proboscis stops growing, and that's where you get the suck face look. On a fruit list. So if you've seen that, that's, that could be something else as well, but Cuculeo is the prime culprit. 
And in southern New England, um, growers lose 90, 95% of their crops to Kukulia. Now, you're not going to see that strength of numbers, but, but you get the idea. That fruitlet there, that's a gala apple. That's not going to stay on the tree or grow into anything. That, that's lost. It's gone. And the larvae that have hatched and gone inside, they want to get to the soil. So there's points of vulnerability in that. Um, one is the fact that Kukulio tends to do a lot of its damage at night. And during the day, it has a habit of dropping to the ground just in case birds would find them in the tree. So the fact that they'll knock to the ground led to the development of, back in the 1860s, there was about three different manufacturers of these wheelbarrows with big slitted umbrellas. And they would ram the trunk of the tree, and the cuculeos, right at dawn, would fall into the umbrella and then dribble down into a jar of kerosene. But it, it, it's a po point of vulnerability, with, not that we're all going to go out with these splitted wheelbarrows today, but it, it's a point of vulnerability because that was their habit. They, they tended to go down, but they were hanging out there until the sun warmed them up. Um, the use of the clay becomes a barrier, not so much because they can't penetrate, but because the clay flakes off onto them and they want to go elsewhere. And the use of that clay allows you to push and pull to cool out to certain trees that are not treated. So this clay, besides costing money, it makes it look like an artificial Christmas tree. Sufficient coverage to repel the cuculeo looks like that. Um, pottery grade kaolin does not work because it blocks photosynthesis, just like on a dirt road, the dust that comes on plants inhibit, inhibits the amount of sunshine they get. But when they refined the clay to four microns in size in the 1990s, became a really phenomenal tool because it flaked off into insects. So that, I'm six foot three. Now I'm three sixteenths of an inch. I'm a cuculeo. Another amazing transformation in front of your eyes. And four microns means plays gets into my armpits and up my nostrils and into my eyeballs and into my belly button. If cuculeo had a belly button, I, I just start to groom. And I'm, I think thoughts about how weird you are that you did this to me. And, and I'm thinking about where can I go? And I look for and crawl to and fly to a tree that was not treated. And these trap trees, in turn, become a point of vulnerability. And I'll explain that in a couple slides. The fact that the clay was refined means that photosynthesis, the light reflects and gets to the skin of the fruit and to the leaf surface. And it actually helps keep the fruit cooler. They actually use more kale and clay for growing on the west coast in the dry climates to prevent sunburn than we use here in the east to try to deter cuculea. So originally the idea was you had to keep this clay coverage on for six, eight, even ten weeks, which A is a lot of money, it's a lot of labor, and it also means that you're going to have white residues on your fruit, which you'll say, would you like to eat my holistic apple on it? It looks like it's coated with DDT. And the conventional fruit never has that appearance, so then you have to wash the fruit, and we're back to spitting, and, and it's not really pleasant. So a better way to go about this is to recognize that certain trees are an, a strong draw for cuculeo. Now, th this can vary by bioregion where you are, um, and it also depends on the spring. A really cool spring, they might wait for apple, but in the warm spring, they might go right for stone fruit. So you have to kind of learn the nuance of your site and what's going on. But typically, plums are a strong draw. They are the plum cuculea. They have an adherence to why they're named that. Um, apples like Liberty, which is the scab immune variety, seem to really attract them. Lush growing edible crabs like chestnut crab or cur crab seems to attract them. That's one of the trees I use as a draw tree. And what you do at a draw tree is these white covered cuculeo arrive and, and they're saying to themselves, I knew he'd miss one, he missed this one. And, and now it's, it's happy, we're going to take out this fruit. And, and there is some sacrificial aspect to this. But their goal, larva and fruit that drop to the ground to get into the soil to pupate. 
they have to get into the soil to pupate, a point of vulnerability. You might go out and roll out tarps so the apples just shrivel on top of the tarp. Some people run little piglets to snatch all those apples. I have a chicken gypsy wagon. <laughs> those hayway wheels were abandoned on our farm. I, I looked at them for like 20 years until I realized, oh, I could make a chicken gypsy wagon out of these. And what we do is we have this section of the orchard where Kuleo seems to come in first. I have some plums there. I have the edible crab. We run a fence around that area. We put the chickens in just time of June drop when fruitlets start to drop. It's, it's a natural aspect of fruit growing. They just never drop enough. And there, there have been orchardists who say, well, I'll just let the chickens everywhere. There was an orchard in Wisconsin, Turkey Ridge Orchard. And, and they bought on the order of like 500 bent egg layers and released them in their orchard. It did a really good job of feeding the foxes. The foxes were very happy. But the chickens congregate here and there. They don't do a regular patrol, but when you can push and pull the problem and then take advantage of that need to get into the soil by one of those different methods, you now create a dynamic where there's a whole lot less Kikulio that can come back at you the next year. And as time goes by, and, and particularly if you're taking those thinnings and taking infested ones and doing the crop circle thing on your black top road, um, you get to a point where there's more balance. I mean, it, it, there can be a lot of work to clean up a site. There can be wild vectors, tree species, fruiting trees. They can even be in your neighbor's yard. Or maybe your yard consists of three trees, but your neighbor has an apple tree. You don't have to have a trap tree. He has the trap tree. <laughs> And maybe you just go out and weirdly, again, it's your neighbor who's been watching you, you're bouncing with this prayer. Maybe you go in there and for two weeks in the middle of June, you roll out orange shag carpet <laughs> sections under his tree. And he's just, wow, what's he doing now? What's she doing now? And you're snagging all these cuculeo and cleaning up the neighborhood. It's many things out there. So there are spray products. You know, one of them is spinosad. And spinosad is, um, there's a particular or soil bacteria that they found on a Caribbean island on the grounds of an abandoned rum factory. I don't know why that's knowledge, why I know that. But they fermented that organism. And in the fermenting of that organism, it produced anti-insecticidal properties, uh, compounds with, with spinosad. And it's very effective against um, moths, it's effective against maggot flies, it's effective against spotted wing Drosophila. Kukuleo is not on the label because it's not on the order of like 95% effective, but it's on the order of like 50-60% effective. Now for the bad news, that quart of liquid formulation of Entrust, that would be the brand name put on the organic formulation, um, costs anywhere from five to eight hundred dollars. It's enough to do four acres of coverage because it's eight ounces per acre that you use. That's bloody expensive. <laughs> um, it's also something you should rotate so that the insects don't develop resistance to the one mechanism. So you rotate materials. It's also something that works great in year one, works great in year two. By year three it starts to get weak and after that it's useless. So once you buy it for six hundred dollars, let's say, then you have to use it, even if you didn't have an issue. Um, but it's there, and I definitely use it on my fall raspberries because of spotted wing Drosophila. I try to knock back that first flush of those fruit flies. I use it in my second application of clay because it also gets saw fly. Now, that's not relevant here yet, but it's also knocking back like 50, 60 percent of Kukulia. So all together, the package makes it pretty good deal for me in terms of the pressure of these assorted insects and it's, it's all woven in here but this, this is the storyline that goes with these few words written on that page um, oh I misspelled a word don't worry about that there, there's other <laughs> there's a joke there. <laughs> there there's other fermented soil organisms 
So there's Marone Innovations, and one of their new products is called Venerate. Same story, knocks back probably more Kukuleo. It also has some effectiveness against brown marmorated stink bugs, so stink bugs being your thing. This costs less than the in trust. Still costs. So then there's coddling moth. Now we're talking about internal feeders. Um, coddling moth <coughs> is pretty ubiquitous worldwide. This is its cousin, oriental fruit moth. So there you see the little things, and, and I think this is a nectarine. And stone fruits, whenever they're wounded, respond with a gum gamosis response. And they're just trying through this sap to push out the problem, whether it's a fungal or bacteria or an insect invader or even just a wound in the trunk. You'll see that big blob of, of gum coming out of the tree. The gum is not an issue. That's just a response. But anyway, if this fruitlet doesn't fall to the ground because one or two of those larvae hatch and eat the seed cavity, if it stays on the tree, those become like openings for brown rot. And you're not going to get much fruit from trees that are got that double whammy going on. So there's multiple options for moss. Uh, I explained BT. I've explained spinosad a little bit. Um, I'll talk about granulosis virus in a minute. Mating disruption in larger orchards. This is a point of vulnerability. A male needs to find a female to impregnate her so she has fertile eggs. And so females draw the male through the use of a pheromone scent. And we, have as humans, have been able to identify and synthesize the pheromone scent of various species of moth. So when that scent is impregnated into twist ties, and you hang on the order of 400 twist ties on branches throughout the orchard, <coughs> the whole area smells like female. And so the males can't find the females because they're hidden in that cloud of pheromone. So larger orchards might utilize a method like that. It's, it's an incredible bit of thought and an incredible idea, but if you're on a more wind-prone site or you've got <coughs> a quarter acre of trees, you don't have a large enough area because moths can still migrate in. So it requires at least an acre, and they usually recommend like four acres of continuous orchard for mating disruption to, to work. Now he here's a cool one. Well, first let's do the numbers. So again, I talked about life cycle. Let, let's zoom in on cotton moth because pretty much everyone's going to experience cotton moth. Cotton moth overwinters <coughs> as a larva in diapause, which isn't important to know, but it means that it's, it doesn't pupate until early spring. So there aren't moths, adults flying until pink early bloom time. It's during bloom that they're going to find each other and mate. And the timing is such that the female is ready to lay eggs once there's discernible fruitlets on the tree because she's going to lay that egg on a branch or a twig or a leaf, or even the fruitlet itself, but really close, because the larva is going to immediately go into the fruit where it's going to be safe. That egg, however, is sitting out there on the branch for 12 to 16 days. If it's a warm spring, it, the pace develops faster. But that's a long time to be out there as a lonely egg. And that egg is going to be snatched by some chickadees, that egg, there's braconid wasps that are going to come along and lay their egg in that egg. So let, let's say that the beneficials knock back the coddling moth potential by 20%. The egg hatches, and within 24 hours, that larva is inside the fruitlet. Well, 24 hours is not a long time. So th there might be a really astute chickadee that snags a few of those. But for the most part, they get in. So let's say 2% are lost there. It's inside the fruit lit for 12 or 14 days on that order. Nothing's getting it. Then one of two things is going to happen. The caterpillar emerges from the fruit lit, and it's going to make its way along the branch and down the trunk to the base of the tree where there's more curly bark. And it just knows instinctively that's the place to find a place to pupate. That's a long journey for a little caterpillar. And so the nuthatch might snag some on the trunk, 
uh, minute pirate bugs are going to snag some. More braconid wasps are going to lay their egg in that larva. So let's say 25% chunk is gone. Or the fruitlet falls to the ground, and now the larva makes its way along the ground past the wolf spiders and the ground beetles and the ants to get to the trunk. That's also a long journey. And that's part of that 25% loss. That larva pupates behind the curly bark, some hiding place. It's in pupation on the order of like 10 to 12 days. During that time, again, a nuthatch, a sap sucker, is finding some of those larvae. Uh, the winsome fly comes and lays its eggs in the pupa case. That kills. So another 20% has been taken out. And if we do the math, beneficials and birds that are there because you've created this diverse orchard ecosystem is taking care of like 60-70% of the calving moss. It's in a much, it's much less pressure and you can deal with it in gentler ways. And one of the ways that they've discovered, remember that journey to the base of the tree, back in the time of the Civil War, they started to make hay braids and they'd tie one just below the level of the first branches and the other maybe four to six inches off the ground at the base of the trunk. And knowing that the timing was as I just described, somewhere about four weeks after bloom, you'd look in those hay braids and you'd start to see a significant number of cobbing moss pupa. They'd gone into the pupal stage. And then you'd remove the hay braids and you would burn them. Similarly, you can take corrugated cardboard and do that on a home orchard scale. You know, that's not a commercial thing, but there's so much intelligence based on the life cycle of what's going on with that cobbing moss that that may be all you need. You don't need to buy it in trust. You know, there's, there's other methods. On the other hand, if you're a commercial grower, um, products like Sidex and Virosoft are virus formulation. And so the first generation of moss gets the virus, which means that replicates in the ecosystem, which gets the second generation of moss. And if you're in a warmer place, there's a third and a fourth generation. That, that's a really effective commercial tool. But again, you choose the tools based on the scale and, and the intensity of your pressure, and it all starts to come together. Then there's neem. I referred to how neem inhibits the molting cycle of insects. Um, it does that by <coughs> mimicking the ectozyne hormone, <coughs> hormone that insects create to go through their molting cycle. So right now I'm referring to going from egg to the different instar stages of larva to pupa and finally to adult. <coughs> neem does not impact adults. So like when I'm talking about plum cuculeo, they don't care. But it very much impacts moths and species that develop on the tree that go through the molting cycle there. And I also use it for the, the whole borer situation, which we'll see in just a couple slides. Um, I like that additional aspect of neem oil. This is why I, I buy from a free trade source where cooperatives in India are being compensated fairly. It's not WR Grace Company. It's not those extracts. Not only because it works to prevent disease in a non-fungicidal manner, but through the mechanisms we've been talking about, but because it impacts those insects. And to really drive this point home, you know, we all were once in a molting cycle. We went from being little children through the teenage years. The teenage years are kind of like when we're larvae. And in the teenage years, this is just one of those analogies to drive home this point. In the teenage years, we listened to a certain kind of music that if that was still on our tape cassette players or our eight tracks or our iPods or our record players, if we listened to that music for like 24, 36 hours straight, we also wouldn't have molted. We wouldn't have developed to the next stage of development and gone on to become adults. And so I call that the Lady Gaga effect. Um, <coughs> it's just, this is something that's going to work against juvenile insects. You have stink bugs in Indiana? So the, the brown marmorated stink bug is a difficult challenge. Um, <clears throat> this is something that's drawn to stone fruits as well as apples. Where it goes in and puts its proboscis to suck juice, 
becomes a hard spot in the pear, becomes a hard spot in the peach. Um, and that's not a pleasant thing. I mean, you can cut it out as a home orchard, is, but commercially it's, it's not something you want. So stink bugs are also attracted to a, a other plants. They, they seem to like cucurbits, so pumpkins, zucchini. So one approach is to just grow a few vines of plants of zucchini in the orchard and you'll see a lot of stink bug activity, especially coming in and out of the blossoms. And when numbers get great, you might do something there that's harsher than you would want to do throughout the whole orchard ecosystem. Harsher might be still an organic spray product like Pyganic. And when you really get into this and you're like, I'm really going to get you stink bug, you'll learn that if you add some diatomaceous earth to the Pyganic application that goes on in the late afternoon because sunlight breaks down the pyrethrums and pyganic, the diatomaceous earth. Did I turn around? Hello? I, am I? No. I, I'm good. I think I'm good. <laughs> am I not good? I'm not good. <laughs> We're down to four minutes. That's okay. I can actually carry it. Are you hearing me in the back? I have enough voice. I'll do what I can. Um, but anyway, the diatomaceous earth acts like a hypodermic needle. It tears into the thorax it's more effectively delivers the pyganic and that kills the stink bug. And maybe you just do the zucchini or maybe you just get into being Dr. Death and you start going out everywhere. But same thing with Japanese beetle. It's difficult. We talked about the tiffia wasp. If you ever see Japanese beetle with white spots on the back of their thorax, never ever kill that Japanese beetle. That beetle has, is carrying the larva of the winsome, the eggs of the winsome fly. They're going to bore into the brain of the beetle. This karma at work. They're going to bore into the brain of the beetle and destroy it and create more winsome flies that get more Japanese beetles as the years go by. But one of the things that I've learned is when I spray the holistic sprays for all those various reasons, the neem acts as a feeding deterrent for adult beetles. And so I'm growing other things in the orchard and, and one of the typical plants that works really well is the common primrose that grows in wild meadows and beetles really love that i mean you still go out and you do this morning walk with your coffee and you tap beetles into a cup of soapy water and, and drown some of them but it's again it's like what are the points of vulnerability they're sluggish in the morning they're easy to knock off they're they're drawn to certain crops like beans or, or Maybe you plant a grape, and that's where you do the pyganic thing. There's ways to succeed here. Borer. Some of you probably have round-headed apple tree borer. So th this is a beetle that lays its egg in the base of the tree, and the grub that hatches spends two years eating the cambium. And if you've ever had a three-, or four-, or five-year-old tree, and suddenly it just blows over in the wind, and you find the base is all chewed up, that's the borer. And here, neem plays a big role, not only in repelling the beetle from laying its egg there, but sprays, I talk about it in the book, are made in June and July, possibly into August. And it also plays a role in that the azadiractins are absorbed by the bark and go where the grub is and stop its development because it's in its molting cycle. Um, there's answers to many things. If you are growing peaches, and you see all this grass, the poop from the, the larvae that are chewing in the base of the tree. Um, that is the work of either the peach tree borer or the lesser peach tree borer. These are moths. And there's different approaches. The neem trunk sprays, that's one method. Um, if you really have a bad infestation, getting parasitic nematodes from a beneficiary insect supplier, mixing that into a mud pack and applying that to the base of the tree provides a soil and environment for the nematode which goes into the tree and gets the borer. Again, it's, if you're facing this challenge, it's important to know it's a worthy seed for you to sprout. If you don't have this problem, great. You don't have to be thinking about it. We're going to end with this pest, the apple maggot fly. So this is a native species to North America that migrated from Hawthorne to the Malus domestica apple. 
and apple maggot fly comes onto the scene somewhere in late June to early July. It first goes for early ripening varieties, then moves on to mid-season varieties, and then can move on to late season varieties. And this is a fly that can only see about three feet. So the scent of the ripening apple is what draws it to that succession of varieties. And so we can scent, put out scent lures near traps. The way the trap works, kind of like this, you're an expecting mother and you're thinking about your baby, your child, and where he or she is going to go to school, and you're thinking, well, I'd like to go to the Montessori school, or I'd like to send them to the Waldorf school, or we have a really good public school here in this town. The, the female maggot fly is thinking the same thought. She's thinking, which is the best apple to lay my egg? Only seeing three feet, she flits about. And if it's within that radius of the fruit lure is a sticky fall trap, that becomes the Waldorf school, the Montessori school. They're drawn to that bigger apple, and so they get stuck. And you can significantly knock back maggot flies. It may grow beyond the trap stage, but for the most part, you can significantly knock back maggot fly by understanding the dynamics of using the traps in early ripening varieties in late June, moving them or adding more traps out in mid-July on mid-season varieties. And if it's a warm summer, um, and it's going to be a warm fall, which you can only get that. It goes on to late varieties. And that trap can be a very effective way without getting into sprays. Um, Spinosad is effective against maggot fly, but at $150, $200 an acre cost, a very expensive way to use a hit on this method. Now, another method, besides plastic ball traps or wooden ball traps, is understanding that everything on earth has a purpose. But like those hay rake wheels, it took me 20 years to figure I could make a chicken gypsy wagon. Well, I've always gone into the supermarket where they sell apples. They sell apples that, I don't think, I taste chemicals, at least I think I do. So I'm usually not very pleased, but along with those apples, some of which hold appeal for me, um, there's, there's this one label that says Red Delicious. I think it's Red Delicious. Um, I never had any idea what they were for. I mean, I, I knew that you could, you could throw them against a wall and they wouldn't show a bruise, but it wasn't like something you wanted to eat. Um, the skin got tougher. And then I realized they're here. They're here for a really important purpose, and that's to stick a wire through them and then cover the surface of the fruit with tangle trap but don't cover completely the stem end or the calyx so that the odor can emanate out of the ripening fruit. And there you have this apple maggot fly trap that you don't have to clean later because you're going to reuse it next year. It's just going to essentially dissolve. Um, but it also has another purpose in that after the apple season, if you leave them in the tree, they retain their redness for the holiday season. And so you get your decorating done in the same in the same maneuver. Um, so there's many ways to go about it. I, I have thrown so many seeds at you. Um, we didn't get to the variety part or the community marketplace. Um, that's not atypical, there's so much to cover. I hope you've heard some of the bits you needed to hear for this fruit season. I hope you're inspired to understand a little bit about how nature does health and how we can steward that, work with that, ideally not screw it up. I hope I haven't talked you whips out of planting trees at all, but that happens sometimes. There are, we do lose some people along the way. But it, it's really been great to share this day with you, and I thank you for having me.